morning, church. This morning's Bible reading is uh, from Mark, and I'll be reading uh, Mark verse 2, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 22. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many had gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralysed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralysed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralysed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralysed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralysed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them. This amazed everyone and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch and an unshrunken cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away the old, making the tear worse, and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new skins. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Good to see you all. Uh, we're going to spend some time uh, on that Bible reading. Um, if you are here with us for the first time, or if you are not here last week, we uh, started a sermon series on the book of Mark, or the Gospel of Mark, called... Uh, it's working, uh, follow the real king. And we spent some time on, uh, on chapter one. Um, now, this sermon series will take us through to the end of, uh, or through to Easter. And so it would be helpful if you want to read these chapters um, ahead of time. So to get uh, your head around, and it'll be helpful for you um, to understand what we've, uh, we are talking so before we uh, come to today's uh, sermon, allow me to pray and commit this time to God. Heavenly Father, we uh, give you great thanks and praise for uh, who you are. 
And we are thankful that, that you are present here with us through your spirit. And Lord, you are at work in and through us. And Lord, we are thankful for your word. And Lord, we are thankful, Lord, your word uh, doesn't just inform us, it transforms us. So we pray this morning that this work of transformation will happen. And we pray this for your glory uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, where we come from, which is Sri Lanka, um, we have many unrelated uncles and aunties. Uh, the reason, because it is offensive to call someone older in our country uh, by their first name. So we have to call them uncle or auntie, right? Other cultures have the same thing? Yeah, 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 good, good, great. Um, so in the Middle East, uh, it is offensive to show the sole of your feet or your feet to somebody else. Uh, in some cultures, showing up on time for a meal is considered offensive. Kind of says you are very hungry. Um, I think so. Uh, giving and receiving gifts or anything with your left hand is considered offensive in some cultures. Opening gifts in front of the gift giver is offensive in some cultures. All right? So you might have to ask one another, because we are a multicultural, multi-ethnic community. Uh, you might have to just uh, sit around this morning or uh, morning tea and have a chat and say, what is offensive in your culture? Okay. But would you agree this morning if I say being a Christian is offensive? that it creates conflict. Here in Mark chapter 2, and then first, and, and, and the first uh, six verses of Mark chapter 3, Mark records five incidents. Now, the common theme of these five incidents is conflict. Conflict. Jesus and his disciples offended people as they went along. Not that they were looking for ways to offend uh, people, but Jesus' identity, his mission, his way offended people, especially the religious leaders of his day. And it caused conflict. You see, Jesus challenged the existing systems, right, as he, as he walked along with his disciples. So this morning, what we're going to think about is, is this. The three things that offend, offended people and brought conflict for Jesus and his disciples, his identity, his mission, and his way. Because if we think about it, even today, these are the three things that will offend people and cause Conflicts. So let's dive in. Let's dive in. Uh, the first thing that caused offense uh, and conflict was Jesus' identity, isn't it? We have this action-packed story in verses 1 to 12 of Mark chapter 2 uh, of Jesus healing a man who was paralyzed. He couldn't, he couldn't walk. Now, I won't go into all the details. So you can read that through. But what I want to focus this morning is what caused the first conflict for Jesus. Verse 5, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now when the religious leaders who were in that room heard this, they, all the alarm bells started ringing, right? Because verse 7, they, they correctly recognized only God could forgive sins. And Jesus is not God. I mean, he's just a simple man who just appeared on the scene. How could Jesus forgive sin? And this, is, this is blasphemy. And Jesus knew what they were thinking, right? Verse 9. And he asked them, what is, what is easier to do? To say to this, this man to, to, that your sins are forgiven or to say to him, get up, take your mat and walk. And if you think about it, it is easier to say your sins are forgiven, right? Because you don't know whether that happened or not. 
Uh, it's, it's just something that happens inside. So you can get away with it. But if he had said, walk, get up your, take up your mat and, and walk, then he has a big challenge in his hand, doesn't he? What if he couldn't get up and, and, and walk? But in verse 10, if you look at it, he says, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. In other words, he says, so that you may know that I am God, just like you are thinking, he ordered this man to get up, take his mat, and go home. And that this man does, to the great amazement of the people who were there, right? And they started praising God because they've seen God at work. You see, friends, uh, the, the religious leaders, uh, they didn't take offense at Jesus' teaching, his healing. No, they didn't take offense of that. They didn't, they didn't even take offense because Jesus said that this man was a sinner. But when, they said, your, when he said, your sins are forgiven, they knew what Jesus meant. That Jesus was claiming to be God. And they took offense of that. Now friends, in a, in a pluralistic society like us where we are living, we have the same problem, don't we? People will take offense at Jesus' identity. People will be happy to treat him as, as a good teacher, a, a guru, a, a miracle worker, a good man, a, 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 um, a revolutionary. They might even treat him, treat him as one of many gods. But they will take offense if we make the claim that Jesus is the only true God. People will reject us. People will ridicule us. There will be conflicts in our families. There will be conflict in, with, with our friends. And in some places, we might even be put to death for saying that Jesus is the only true God. The identity of Jesus, the King whom we are following, will cause offense and conflict any day. The second reason that caused conflict was his mission. His mission. And as we saw last week, uh, Jesus' mission was to call people into, into the kingdom of God. And he said, you, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you need to repent and believe in the good news. And we also said last week, to believe in the good news is actually to believe in Jesus, to follow him. So here in verses 13 to 17, uh, we, we see, don't we, Jesus is calling a tax collector by the name of Levi, who, also, who is named later by Jesus as Matthew. And like the fishermen in, in chapter 1, the four fishermen in chapter 1, Levi, immediately, he leaves his tax booth behind, his job behind, and then he follows Jesus. Now, tax collectors in Jesus' day were considered sinners. Not sure what happens today. Because they were collecting tax on behalf of uh, their enemies, the Romans. And they, they cheated, they, they, they collected extra money, they, they took bribes, and they were treated as sinners on par with robbers and murderers. And then what we see is Jesus doesn't just call a sinner to, to be his disciple, that is unheard of in Jesus' day, but then the next thing that we see is uh, Jesus is actually hanging out with Levi in his house with all his friends. Mark doesn't want us to miss who Jesus was hanging out with. 
because three times in, in, verse, in two verses, in verses 15 and 16, Mark tells that Levi's friends were tax collectors and sinners. And when something is repeated three times, it means that you want to see this. He wants us to see this. These, these sinners could have been murderers, prostitutes, thieves, womanizers, addicts, drunkards, gamblers, and, and, and so on. It was sinful for, for a Jew to have a meal, table fellowship with a Gentile sinner uh, like Levi. And yet that's exactly what Jesus does, isn't he? He eats and drinks with sinners and tax collectors. He becomes a, f- a friend of sinners. And sure enough, this offends the Jewish religious, religious leaders. And par- you know, the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, would have been happy for Jesus to, to hang out with them, and they might even uh, have joined with Jesus if these people had changed their ways, given up their tax collector jobs and all their sinful practices, and started to read their Bibles, uh, fasted and prayed, attended Bible study groups, and, and ticked off all the boxes, or they would have been extremely happy to go along with Jesus and have fellowship with these people. But you see, Jesus doesn't. He doesn't wait till they change their ways. He doesn't give them a a checklist, okay, uh, complete this before you join me, before I love you and have fellowship with you. And one of the commentators says this, The scandal of this story is that Jesus does not make moral repentance a precondition of his love and acceptance. Rather, Jesus loves and accepts tax collectors and sinners as they are. If they forsake their evil and and amend their lives, uh, they do so, as did Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, not in order to gain Jesus' favor, but because Jesus has loved them as sinners. See, the only precondition to enter God's kingdom is to be a sinner. And ironically, a great sinner stands closer to God than those who think themselves as righteous. And so to the offended religious leaders, Jesus outlines his mission. It says, just like a doctor, how that was, just like a doctor is, is, is of benefit to someone who is sick, not for someone who is healthy. Jesus says, I have come to call the sinners, not the righteous. Calling sinners and, and making them disciples is not uh, an exception in Jesus' mission. That was his mission. That is his mission. And that is why we are here today. Isn't it? And as followers of Jesus, this is our mission as well. To call sinners into fellowship with Jesus. To reach out to the outcast, to to love the sinners. And I wonder what that looks like in your life. Who would you reach out to in your life today? Who would you have kind of considered, okay, they're out of reach, they don't belong here, I'm not going to invite them to church, I'm not going to spend time with them. If I spend time with them, I'm going to look bad. People will think I'm one of them. Might mean that we might hang out with them, have tea or coffee. Pray with them, play with them, study with them. Visit them in presence, as some of you do. So that we will have opportunities to share Jesus with them. And we might invite them to church and and sit with them 
introduce them to others, to, we might become friends of sinners. But when we do, expect people to be offended. Especially those in the church, sadly. Those who call themselves righteous. Those who don't understand the mission and the heart of Jesus. Expect people to be upset. Expect people to leave church. Expect to lose friends. But also expect God to be at work in those whom that we are hanging out with. One of our friends told us a story about uh, a couple who, who started attending their Bible study group a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Uh, and they were, this, this couple, was, they were not married, but they were living together, which is contrary to God's word. But this group, they, they, they accepted them, they, they shared fellowship with them, they loved them, they shared the good news of Jesus, they studied the Bible with them. And, and after a couple of months, this couple recognized that they were living in sin. So they decided that they are going to live apart until they got married. You see, when we love sinners, God loves them even more. And then he goes to work in their lives to change them and transform them. And the third reason which brought conflict for Jesus and his disciples was his way. His way. Jesus calls his followers uh, to, a, to a radically new way of living, right? Um, here we have three stories in verses um, 18 to 27 and chapter 3 verse 1 to 6 there are three stories where the way of Jesus and his disciples uh, the way they were living was contrary to how the society or the culture the, the religious leaders were expecting them to live the first story is in verses 18 to 20, where uh, we see Jesus and his disciples, they, they don't follow the rules of Jewish fasting. In Jesus' day, every Jew had to fast at least one day, one day, 24 hours without food, uh, and that was the day of atonement. So fasting was, you see what, where it's going? It's kind of a way of uh, twisting God's arm. It was kind of uh, manipulating God's hand, right? So some people come to Jesus and, and they ask why his disciples aren't fasting like John's disciples and, and the disciples of the Pharisees. Uh, Jesus tells them, you know what? Now is not the time to fast. It's time to feast. And he, he tells this, this parable of, of the wedding banquet where he says, you know, the guests don't fast when the bridegroom is in the house. It is disrespectful to go to a party, to go to a, to a wedding banquet and, and not eat and put this long face and sit there. It is a time to be joyful. What is Jesus doing here? Jesus is identifying himself as the bridegroom, isn't he? The, the Messiah that they have been waiting for, fasting for, is here. So it's not time to be fasting. Instead, be joyful. And then we have two more stories, right? And in these two stories, I'm not going to go into details, but Jesus and his disciples are confronted by the religious leaders because they have broken the Sabbath law. Verse 23, as they were, as they were walking along through a grain field on a, on a Sabbath day, Jesus and his disciples, they, they pick the heads of grain and then start eating. And then chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, we have Jesus deliberately healing someone who had a crooked hand. For the Jews, keeping the Sabbath day was far more important than, and serious than, than the question of fasting. The day of Sabbath was originally intended by God, installed by God himself, 
as, as a day of, of rest and, and worship and, and connecting with God. But as the years went by, religious leaders added laws and bylaws to make sure that people were doing the right thing. So in one of their books called the Misna, there are, there are 39 classes of work that people shouldn't be doing or Jews shouldn't be doing on a Sabbath day. It prohibited work like plowing, harvesting, hunting, carrying or cooking or, or lighting a fire. It also prohibited things like writing more than one letter. Right? If you're writing something, more than one letter you couldn't write. Just one letter you should be writing on the Sabbath day. Or putting a stitch. You could just put one stitch if you're sewing, but you couldn't put more stitches than one stitch. You're not allowed to heal someone. You're not allowed to harvest. So you can imagine the frustration, isn't it? The, the annoyance by the religious leaders uh, when, they, when they see Jesus and his followers. They're, they're not following the age-old rules and the traditions anymore. And you can hear them uh, maybe, maybe saying, you know, hey, if you want to follow this Jesus guy, you can. But you must also follow all these Jewish traditions. You must not part away from your old way of living. You must tick all these boxes. Don't give up your old ways. And it is to address this that Jesus told two parables. Everyday stories in verses 21 to 22 in the middle of that section. He says, no one sews a patch of unshrunk or a new cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away, it will shrink, and the tear will be even worse. And he tells a, a second parable. He says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Now, some of you might be wondering, what are wineskins? We have wine bottles, but that is what wineskin look like. Because otherwise, the wine will burst the skins. Both the wine and the wineskin will be ruined. You now, they pour new wine into new wineskins. What is Jesus saying? He's saying Jesus is the new patch and the new wine. You cannot, you say, you cannot add him as an attachment or an accessory to your old way of living. When someone becomes a, a Christian or, or a follower of Jesus, uh, you embrace a new way of living. We, we march to a new beat, don't we? We, we must let go of our, our old ways of living. It's like we switch teams. You used to play for this team, now you're playing for the opposite team. You need to take off this jersey and wear this jersey, and you need to start running this way, not this way. So if you have become a Christian, what, is, what does that mean? You cannot be a Christian and a Jew. You cannot be a Christian and a Hindu. You cannot be a Christian and a, and a Buddhist. You cannot be uh, doing your old life and also add Christianity to, into your life. And, and certainly you cannot add or, or take every bit of good thing from different religions and make a religious cocktail and say, well, this is my religion. Following Jesus is an entirely new way of living. And the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian church, right? He says, if anyone is in Christ, you're a new creation. The old has gone. The new is here. The old ways, the old religious practices, the, the ways we used to live need to be replaced by the way Jesus wants us to live. And again, when that happens, friends, we're going to offend a lot of people. Don't you think? 
There will be conflict. People will wonder why you don't join them in, in, in their sinful practices. People will be upset that you don't practice religion as you used to do when you were growing up, perhaps. They will accuse you of, of betraying your, your family or your culture or your family practices. And people will wonder why your values have changed. And when, when that happens, friends, we need to remember new wine goes into new wineskins. That we are now in a new team, Team Jesus. Now, if you, if you notice in this story, in, the, in these um, stories, Mark tells us of the conflicts. Uh, he tells us wherever Jesus went, there was conflict. He offended people. But if you notice, he doesn't tell us a formula to avoid conflict. Right? It is as if he's saying, if you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to follow Jesus, the real king, you better count the cost. And this is chapter 2 in Mark's gospel. You better count the cost. You are going to offend people. There will be conflict. There, there's no way around it. I guess he's saying, follow him anyway. Be witnesses of Jesus' identity. Be on his mission, loving and welcoming sinners. Commit to live his way. Because we are called out of darkness into his marvelous light, isn't it? So live in the light. Live in the light. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you because you send out as people you love people who have shown grace. So help us as we go out to show your love and your grace. And Lord, as you fellowship with us through your Holy Spirit, help us to fellowship with others that you put in our path. We ask this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you.